Hello, everybody. My name is Auric Rocha. As you can see there, uh, I'm the moderator for today's event. Uh, welcome this, for this uh, Los, Los Angeles Film School live stream. Uh, we're going to be talking uh, with an alum today, uh, Jason Beal. Um, his, I'm Jason. I'm grabbing this title from your uh, your email. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> director of Post-Production and Digital Assets for Legendary Pictures. Right. Um, and you graduated from LA Film School early 2000-ish. We'll yeah, that's right. There. Um, very old, very old. <laughs> um, but uh, be, before we, well, I, I do want to go over, I'm just kind of looking at your, um, your inner movie database profile here, um, just to name a few that I'm sure you've heard of is Upcoming Dune, Godzilla versus Kong, Godzilla King of the Monsters, um, Ant-Man and the Wasp, you worked on his art department, uh, Avatar, Terminator, so, so uh, Thor, so lots of movies I'm sure everyone has heard of. Um, but I'd like to uh, open it up, just kind of talking about how from graduating uh, to your current situation, like what that path was like, because you've worked on not just as a um, uh, post-production person, but you mentioned on being on set as well. Because um, I think a lot of questions students have is, you know, once I graduate, now what? <laughs> I have a piece of paper that says I know how to make movies, uh, but what do I do now? So, um, so yeah, if you don't mind starting there. Yeah, so I got kind of lucky. Um, I graduated from LA Film School and then I was, at USC taking some classes and a teacher asked me, hey, do you want to come make a movie with me? And I was, you know, I was like a young kid. I was like, of course, that's why I'm going to school to learn. So that person took me on a movie called The Shaggy Dog. And I worked on that, it was my first movie. Um, from there, I remember it, it was a Friday and it was supposed to be my last day. I really hadn't cleaned up my office or did anything. And the teacher, his boss called me on my phone and was like, have you uh, cleaned out your office yet? And I was like, uh, unfortunately, no. And he was playing a trick. He goes, I thought I told you to clean out your office. And then I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. He goes, I'm just kidding. I'm going to pick up, a, uh, send a truck over there and I'm going to pick all your stuff and you're starting on Mission Impossible 3 on Monday. So I was like, oh, you know, I mean, that was a great, it was a great start. And from there, I think I worked on a movie called, uh, well, The Fantastic Four and The Silver Surfer. And then I believe, yeah, then I did Avatar. And after Avatar, I went to Terminator Salvation. And what I didn't learn at this point in time, no one was really traveling at this point in time. So um, Avatar is about a two year movie. And then I went on a movie out of town called Terminator Salvation in Albuquerque. And then everybody forgot about me because that was off the radar for about three years. And then I remember I was like, it, I couldn't find a job. I was waiting, I think it was, nine months maybe a whole year went by i didn't work i was on unemployment i was like do i have to start taking another career and then luckily another job came and then by the end of working in production because i know you guys always get scared about how finding jobs the first thing i was moving then it would take two to three months and then by the end of it i had to be asked people to take breaks so i'm like no i can't start on that movie i need a break off that so it will happen I know a lot of people get scared, but you got to keep pushing. Like I said, I got, it was like a year. I thought I should give up film, but you know, I never gave up and it kept on happening. Awesome, awesome. So I, I'm curious how, cause, cause again, like currently it, it looks like you're working as, again, I'm just looking at your inter yeah. data profile. It says post-production executive. Can you yeah. describe what that means exactly? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll start a little bit earlier. Actually, I was working on San Andreas in uh, post-production and visual effects, and I was working for this guy named Randy Starr, and I, I thought I did a good job, but I never heard from Randy Starr. And then one day he calls three years later, and he's like, what movies are you working on? And I was, you know, like, I was like going down like a whole list of Marvel movies, and then he goes, oh, you don't want this job. And I go, wait, 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 what job is this? Uh -huh. And uh, he had a job over at Legendary Studios. And at that time, I'd been traveling a lot. I had a girlfriend at the time, and she was all mad that I was always out of town. So I was like, OK, this can work out. And then I flew home for a couple of days, interviewed with them. And they called me. And I put in my last couple of weeks at Ant-Man and Wasp and went over to Legendary. And post-production, um, you're basically working with 
editors and kind of managing and overseeing the film and as far you're doing your budgeting so all your production class you know the movie magic budgeting was great i'm the only one that actually knows it in my department so i actually get to take all that responsibility on and that's one of the things you learn at la film school that's going to give you an edge over a lot of people you're going to know how to budget and do all those tools that a lot of people don't like well my even boss needs to do something she has to call accounting to have it in there and i can just do it myself Gotcha. And then a lot of things we do is we work with marketing. Um, and we're just kind of, it's actually, it's a big process. I don't know, the start from processing, like the beginning of the production and we'll work with the, with the DP and we'll pick um, DI houses and the DI house is gonna work with the color of the film. Mm -hmm. And then we'll always pick the dailies company too. So the dailies are the guys obviously taking the camera cards in and ingested them and stuff like that. And we'll work out a perfect workload for that. So we'll kind of oversee and pop her head in all throughout production. And then obviously once editorial starts up, then we're managing them, we're making stuff, share stuff, gets the visual facts and back to the DI back and then also obviously sound as well. So there's a whole bunch of sound formats. We'll take those in and at Legendary, we're in charge of America, Japan and China. So then we'll go through getting all this stuff translated and subtitled and sent out and Thank God we work with Warner Brothers. They do the rest of the world. But uh, yeah, I mean, you make the movie pretty much three times when we're doing it. And, you know, you'll have to take out scenes and learn all the intricacies of every different country that's different and passing all their censorship. So that's kind of post-production. A lot of people actually get in post-production at the studio and think they're going to be editing. You're not going to be editing. I mean, you can, you can edit some marketing pieces for marketing, which happens a lot or subtitles, stuff like that. So I like to kind of steal all those projects because, you know, I went to film school and sometimes I want to feel like I'm making a movie. So I'll jump on and steal all the marketing edit editing projects. Yeah, I do find it because I've lived in LA now for six years. And I think one of the things that I learned as I got here that I didn't really learn in film school was there are so many jobs in the industry that yeah. we don't really hear about. I mean, you, you think even the movies that have credits that are as long as the movie, with all the special effects, like there are still more names that people that are just employed at Legendary or Warner Brothers and, you know, are just kind of doing the day-to-day -day stuff. So I, I didn't know if you had any, um, I don't know, any, any more insight as to like the other kinds of jobs that are out there. Cause, cause again, like, I think everyone is like, I want to be an editor. I want to be a cinematographer. And, and sometimes it's, you either got to work your way up or, or I know a lot of people that just like, you know, I'm happy working where I'm working and being in the industry and, and that's, that's good. Like, um, so yeah. Yeah, let's just take editorial. I mean, when you say I want to be an editor, I mean, there's, everybody thinks of the main editor. Right. But there's obviously the assistant editors, uh, second assistant editor that are actually working to be an editor. It's not like an assistant director that has nothing to do with directing. But a lot of that stuff, when you're doing those first and second assistant jobs, it's more paperwork and managing and then every once in a while your boss would be like hey why don't you screen these couple of clips together let's see what they look like but that's not really what you're really doing at the beginning when you're in editorial right and then from there i mean there's visual effects editors and they're just handling visual effects and doing the all the metadata and stuff goes with visual effects um let's see there is music editors so their job is to work with the composer ADR, Foley sound, and take that stuff and add it to the actual cut that the main editor makes and then send that back to him and the director to get sign off. So I would say that every title you hear in a movie, there's probably two or three jobs that have that same title that do something completely different. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting to me too, because I feel like the, the stories that we hear of people like jumping to stardom, especially directors, it's like they did one little indie film and now they're making... Jurassic World, you know, and so I feel like everyone is like hopeful to be that person that's just going to like skyrocket. I mean, um, I've but, seen but that not, happen. Yeah, I mean, it's very rare. I mean, most people yeah. to skyrocket, unfortunately, it's through the nepotism. The rest of us, we right. have to get in there and grind and just keep right. grinding. And basically, you'll be noticed. I mean, that's how it was. I mean, I was grinding. And like I said, sometimes I didn't even work for a little bit. But I just kept on grinding, always doing a good job, always trying to be better than the other person mm -hmm. and go. And, and I always ask for more money, too. I think that helped somehow. They just thought it was better. <laughs> <laughs> ask for more. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's the key from my perspective. It's like like you have to be willing to like take that low level, you know, just cataloging, you know, the edits and then, you mm -hmm. know, working your way up to, yeah, instead and of I'll, expecting to. And it, uh, you can tell like uh, on the call, we had a call before you guys to talk a little bit. And I was just mentioning like, even when I'm at the studio, like me and other people at the studio who've actually been to film school or have worked in production, we can sit back and tell which, which one of our you know, fellow employees did or did it. So like the skills you learn in the film school, they are always come with you. And the thing is, if you don't keep pushing from there, people will catch you up. So like, if you go into a PA job, you're gonna have, I would say probably a year or two experience off anybody else. Now you just have to keep going with that and being stagnant. Now I see people let it catch up. So you already have an edge doing, going to film school, making your little student projects. You might think they're not important, but the main thing you learn from a student project, it doesn't even have to be the best one, it's how to complete something, how to get stuff done with, with the resources you have. And that is what separates you from everybody else. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, maybe this would be a good tangent because we wanted to show uh, the trailer to Dune which I'm assuming, like you were saying, like there is a process to like putting together the trailer and advertising yeah. uh, aspects for, for a movie. And I'm assuming it was probably a different editor than the editor that's actually editing Dune and, and his or her team. Um, so, uh, so yeah, uh, maybe we can watch that and then kind of yeah. talk about that process. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, let's go ahead and watch the trailer for the upcoming Dune. What did you see? There's a crusade coming. Do you often dream things that happen just as you dream them? Yes. The test is simple. Remove your hand from the box and you die. What's in the box? Pain. You inherit too much power. You have proven you can rule yourself. Now you must learn to rule others. Something none of your ancestors learned. My father rules an entire planet. He's losing it. He's getting a richer one. He'll lose that one too. Arrakis is a death trap. I'll kill them. This is an extermination. They're picking my family off one by one. Let's fight like demons. An animal caught in a trap will gnaw off its own leg to escape. What will you do? I know you. One day, the legend will be born. All of civilization depends on it. The future, I can see it. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. My Lord Duke. Where the fear is gone, only I will remain. Go, go, go!
All right, very exciting. Um, yeah, so when that happens, so first of all, there's gonna be the head of marketing. He'll make a request to my department, which is post-production, and ask for certain clips to give this vibe. We'll pick those up, we'll have editorial, do an export, we watermark them, and then he kind of puts them together really roughly in whatever program he has. It could be Final Cut. We've been kind of trying to make him use Premiere. He can't touch Avid, so <laughs> then they, they have their own editor or they'll have, well, this is where I like to steal projects to come across my desk <clears throat> to just feel creative, but you don't, I wouldn't have to. It's not my responsibility to redo edits and start editing the movie or, or whatever, but in this case, I always like to do it. I didn't do too much on this trailer actually, but mm -hmm. like on the Godzilla, I did more, but that one actually came across my desk. I did a little cleanup work and then we'll send it to a trailer house. Sometimes we'll do it all in house. We sent that out to a trailer house. So I'll put a couple edits together and put it back. We'll change stuff, or this is where I'll, I'll change stuff too, send it back. And then we'll decide and lock the cut, just kind of like you're doing on a movie. Gotcha. But that's all from Avid Material. And we, I mean, a little thing that's like you guys, when you're in film school, usually shoot it, put it in Avid, maybe do some color tweaking, but not too much really when you're in film school. This is when, this is kind of what separates like a big motion picture from like a normal traditional film school movie as well. We'll send this to a DI house that does final coloring and that and the DP usually sits with them and works out colors. And even before we're shooting, they'll do, they'll set up a LUT. Um, that's a lookup table for not you non-DP or color students. I don't know where everybody else sits and they'll make a look of a film. And then that'll be our standard look that we'll kind of put on their dailies and stuff we'll put into the Avid. But when you get into a trailer that we know is going to theaters, you need to have like a final theatrical color, which is actually a different color space. So we'll do that. We'll have that set up and then we'll actually go and go put that on a mixing stage. And we'll actually do a 5.1 mix usually just for that. And we'll come in, approve that, make changes. And then it'll come back to my desk. And then we'll say, oh, we have to do that for China. Now, this is another time where I could just send it out. Or I'll just go, and, like on this one, I just went into After Effects, brought all the titles in myself, made it into, you know, I, I, luckily we had a Chinese intern. So I just went to her and we're like, OK, what's that? And she would write the characters in her little iPhone and then send them to me and I put them up there. Um, there was actually a pre-trailer before that where we actually had like logos with actors' names that went across and you have to literally match because sometimes uh, the trailer house doesn't want to give you their files. So then you'll, you'll match it and you'll go through After Effects or if they give it to you, it's great. And then you just type in the names and then resend that out and then you'll do that for China. And then we wrap these things called DCPs or to our, what is it, digital cinema, per, uh, I don't even know what the P is, sorry guys. <laughs> Yeah, and that's that's a format that you can actually send to a theater and they ingest on their server. And then there's a key that only unlocks that for a certain time. So whenever you go to a movie, they have keys that only say you can play this at this time. And no one can play it outside of that time. I mean, there's kind of a way to cheat, but I mean, it's getting harder and harder. But yeah, so that's why a theater can't just decide they want to play Dune at 2.30 when they were supposed to play it at 5 because the key won't be open to that time. Gotcha, gotcha. So, so when you get the footage to make the trailer, is do you just get like the whole movie and then you pick and choose? Or are you getting like raw footage? Are you getting stuff that, you know, it doesn't have effects applied to it yet or? So it depends. I mean, for Dune, it's such a big movie. We kind of were starting to think about the trailer while we're shooting. Mm -hmm. So we were trying to get those clips into visual effects as fast as possible. So, because knowing, or I mean, if VFX is smart too. They'll think about scenes that people might want to use in the trailer and they'll try to get those into visual effects. It might not be the final, final you see in the movie, but we try to push those along faster than the other clips that not so much. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. Um, I just wanted to jump over to some of the QA. So, as a reminder, like if anyone has some questions, you can. Uh, Type them in, and we'll see them here and, and read them. 
but Joe Byron's asking uh, if you still get to work with any other LA film grads. Like, have you stayed in contact with anyone or? I have actually, there's a bunch of us that got together maybe um, before COVID and they had a project and they reached out to me and I hooked them up with a couple of my buddies at ETA. Then, I mean, we pitched, they're still pitching right now, but I set them up with a whole bunch of contacts. Um, as far as worked on a project, no, we've tried. There's a couple of us that's tried, but it just never happened or some, we split up, but we definitely keep in contact and we definitely change, like exchange con like contacts to help each other out. Like I've definitely given them that. They've all, you know, they've gotten me job interviews. Never, like I said, I've never taken one of those jobs that they got me, but you know, they've offered, I sent them that. I've sent them PA jobs. I mean, actually, not to tell how old, um, one of my friends side that was in a class with me, his son was my intern once. <laughs> yeah, cool. so stuff like that, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So, so yeah, for those of, you know, film school people listening, like I was thinking one of the, the biggest benefits of going to film school is making these connections so that when you graduate and as, you know, your friends work their way up that you can all help each other. Um, we've, we've definitely kept in touch and like, I, I, I know Brandon used to be the person that used to check out cameras. I think he's a DP. I've seen him a couple times and I went on to visit my friend on a commercial shoot and he was DPing that. So, you know, it's definitely helpful to have your fellow uh, classmates around. Gotcha. Cool. Uh, I'm reading another question here. What is uh, the main thing you would tell a student to learn before moving on from film school? So, because I know you said that when you, you, first, you got your first gig, like someone just kind of snatched you up yeah. because of your, your attitude and everything. Um, but yeah. I would say if you, whatever way you can get into the film business, get in don't wait for the perfect job don't like there was no way i wanted to be an art department when i first started you know i wanted to produce and stuff like everybody else does but <laughs> there's people who wanted to produce and they waited for you know assistant jobs or whatever and they're still waiting mm -hmm. it's better to move around from the inside so know that your first job is probably not going to be what you want to do and it's not you just need to get like I know you guys heard this, but films are like families. So you just need to get into family first and then you can start giving hints to people. Or people will ask you, they're like, is this what you really wanna do? And if you say now, they're like, oh, well, you should call my cousin or you should call my friend over here and they'll start passing around. So take whatever job you can at first to get your foot in the door. And then I'll tell you, like I tell all my assistants, all anybody, any PA that's worked for me, always be 15 minutes early. Don't be late. Because especially you work on these big sets, I mean, a day can cost $20,000 or $500,000. And a lot of times PAs actually have important stuff with them, files, an old time film. And if you're 15 minutes late, you might have made a $50,000 mistake and never make mistakes that are more than your salary because then you'll just be replaced. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. So you're talking about like the, the direction you want to go, like, where, where do you want to go next? Like, like are, are you comfortable here? Do you want, like you, you mentioned producing, like, is that where you're targeting or? I mean, that has always been my goal, but I mean, you know, as you get older, you always start making backup plans. So, I mean, I would like to, I, I think I have three options in my, what I see right in self. And like you said, you don't have to make up your mind when you guys are 20 or whatever age you guys are. Um, right now, I'm um, uh, what director of post production. The VP above me, it's gone. I've I've basically done their job, so I can go to VP. I can be wait to become the head of post production, or I can do a parallel move to production and work in production. Either as my current title as director or a VP or the head of the goal would be the head of post, but if, I mean head of production. And then my other thing would be just to be a producer on an actual individual film. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I still miss doing individual films because like I said, when you're working in a studio, you're in charge of five films. So it's hard to invest your time fully in, in one. You're like, you're split across. So sometimes it's, you, you know, it's hard to have your input actually felt or done like that. And you're actually not supposed to have your impact when you're a you know, executive at a studio, you're just supposed to manage. 
So yeah. sometimes I missed, you know, actually doing something that, you know, it's actually changed the tone. I mean, you can, like we help DP find a DI house. We are doing on Dune, we're doing the scan back process where everything was shot digitally. We're taking that digital and then we're projecting that back on film and then rescanning that film to get that old grain and all those film qualities you normally seen. And that was kind of one of our suggestions that we made. So in that respect, we can, you know, influence the film in a little bit because the DP didn't even know that was an option. That's cool. Yeah. I, that's a bit of a tangent. I did a movie where I copied it to a VHS tape and yeah. then dubbed it back to digital just so right? I like that VHS. Great. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I like that process. <laughs> yeah, and it adds something to it. I, I mean, we were talking about doing, I'm working on Texas Chainsaw Massacre and there's like a little documentary and we were talking about playing like a clip on a CRT television again and mm -hmm. film it. And I mean, I remember our poor man Telecine, <laughs> we ran out of money. We used to have the DV tapes and we used to project them on the, the screen. Or no, when we used to shoot, we shot, it was a film. I think we were shooting like the Area SR2, the 16 millimeter camera, but we didn't have money for Telecity. So we put it on the projector and then we took the DV camera and filmed it. So we had it in the Avid. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Cool. Um, well, one question I had for you, since we're talking about like all the different fields and possibilities, because I, I watched the the podcast that you did with your friend a while back. Okay. Um, and I, I remember you you guys were talking a lot about like story structure and and script and things like that, um, which I feel like some people might be like, well, it doesn't sound like your job really needs to know about any of that stuff, um, and because I feel like there is a lot of of people who are like, I just want to be a DP or an editor. Why would I need to know about art department or, or what other departments are doing, what their business is? So I, I kind of was curious to know what your take on that, like. Well, like, I mean, you can survive and have a career not knowing that, but you're not going to stand out, mm -hmm. right? And I got, where we can tell who's worked on a movie, said not, because I mean, it's weird, I work for the studio now, but when you're a production person, you always hate the studio. <laughs> you're like, those guys don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> but now, I mean, there's some people who don't and some people who do. I think I, we mentioned to you, like the best part is like stuff you can get over on some of the studio people that you know don't have that experience or done any of the parts or doesn't understand how the movies work. Like they'll call somebody else in my department and be like, oh, we don't know how to do that. And like I said, I called them back and they go, I know you know how to do that because I work for you. I was your PA and you taught me how to do that. So send me that stuff through. But I mean, if you don't know story structure, you don't know that stuff, how are you going to put a budget together? How are you know it's going to build what's important and where to spend your money? So you have, and also, I mean, you could be there on a day, like I can come through and I've worked in art department there. I'm like, that's not gonna show up on screen or that's not gonna be pronounced. What are, you, what are you trying to get at? And now that everything's so digital, I mean, 3D's kind of dying, but also when 3D like was there, like you gotta know, oh, how are we gonna scan that? How is that gonna look in 3D? So you have to go and we actually take all the art assets in and they're a part of the picture, you know? They're part of that stereo look that you have. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, you kind of need to learn a little bit of everything. You can't just be set. And like I said, you might be able to get by. There's definitely people, but you're not going to stand out. It's not going to be easy for you to get a job. Like another part of, I do digital assets too. I mean, but I, that was me just saying on one movie, hey, I think I could do digital assets as well when I was a coordinator. And they're like, okay. <laughs> and that actually pushed me on to the next job. So another guy said, hey, do you want to do a movie and do art department and digital assets because no one can do both? And I was like, yeah, I can do it. And then he's like, do you think you can do DIT at the same time? I'm like, that seems pretty much impossible. But he's like, no, you can do it. And then I did that. And then I did such a good job on that that after the movie wrapped, the producers took me back to work at their own home office for a while. So I was on that movie, it was called Ender's Game. I was on that movie for almost two years too. And I went through pre-production and art department, production and camera. Then I worked a little bit with post-production and I was in a producer's office until the movie went out. So the more you know how to do, the longer you keep yeah. getting paid too. Absolutely, yeah. I just feel like it gives you a well-rounded picture of, 
the process and it helps it helps you help others to know what what they're tackling yeah. and, and also unfortunately it knows it lets you know when people are bsing you as well <laughs> <That's true. laughs> so you're like no like, i know you can do it <laughs> exactly um so I got a little behind on some of the questions here. So we got okay. one from uh, Matt Kevin on the chat. Uh, he said he's also an LA film alum. Um, and he's wondering if there's anything the sound editorial department can do to make your life easier. He works in post sound. Uh, I'll be honest. First, sound is my weakest point in post. So there's, I mean, a lot of times I just have to go over stuff with them. Cause I, I mean, I'm more of a picture person. Like I you do better with the DI and the dailies. So sound is my weak point. So I always lean on a good sound editorial and a sound supervisor to help me. Um, I'm good with the finishing, like, you know, all the formats and stuff like that. But as far as labor distribution or I don't know, music cues and source cues, I'm kind of fresh, but yeah, I mean, I guess it's communication and having that paperwork and updates because you know just keep on updating uh, us and like this is where we are and stuff like that i mean what part of sound i don't know if we can respond back but what part of sound post sound is he in uh, it just he just says post sound yeah let me see if you yeah if, if you're listening matt and you want to fill that in uh he also asks uh, it seems like there's uh, post-budget crew sizes are noticeably shrinking each year. Is there anything that can be done to combat this? So right now, um, Legendary, before COVID happened, Legendary did three large blockbusters a year. Now we're doing five movies at a time, and now they're trying to push us to seven. But at the moment, there's no theater money coming in. So we have big movies still waiting to go. Um, I know my friends at Disney and stuff like that, they still have big movies to go. Right now, there's just no way to put them out. So unless you were starting to shoot or already in post when uh, before COVID started, everything's on hold. Yeah. So I don't think they're going, I think the $250 million movie is gone. I think right now, the largest uh, studios are trying to do is about 100 and 125 million. And I think it's just seeing how streaming's going right now. Streaming's a good for us because, like I said, Legendary is a mini major. Like you have your majors, which are Warner Brothers, Disney, Universal, and then the rest are minors or mini majors. But like right now, we can distribute a movie and we don't take a loss because we kind of share every, like I said, Warner Brothers does the rest of the world and we do those three continents. So, and like if you go to uh, Disney, across the street, they have 22 people in their distribution department in LA, and then they have about 20 more in every single country. We have two people. <laughs> so if we take a deal for Netflix, we didn't lose any money, but they do because their people are on salary. I mean, Disney has their own streaming, but let's take that out. If they were trying to make a deal with Netflix, they would lose money and they're paying all those salaries. So that's why they're holding back for, you know, these big movies. It doesn't make sense for them to do that. Like, it makes sense for us because we can still sell it and make a profit. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so it's, it sounds like the pandemic did have a, an effect of budgets, and I would assume not just post, but budgets all around. Huge, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, moving to, I got uh, Tyson. Sorry if I'm pronouncing this wrong. Ristau. Uh, is asking what's the hardest thing you had to do on sets or in the industry and what is your favorite thing about being in the film industry the hardest thing to do on set uh, I, I mean all right this goes back to i say take it <laughs> this is probably not the greatest advice but it works you just have to make sure you're on it i never told when people ask me if i knew how to do something i always said yes yes <laughs> And then there's, there's Professor Google and YouTube. Now, you never want to get yourself in trouble. If you're not a person to learn quick, I don't advise that. But yeah, there are some times I would have to sit up 24 hours or 40. It was like cramming for a test because I said I knew how to do something and I had no idea how to do it. But luckily, I always came out OK, maybe not the best. But that's the stuff. And you know, and like, yeah, when you're set, you know, you don't sleep. <laughs> 
yeah. I, I mean, film, I mean, at the end of the day, filmmaking is not surgery, like on a person. So I feel like if you're, you know, if you're good and you're very flexible and you're a quick learner, you can get through anything. Um, what is your favorite thing about being in the film industry? I would say that you're always learning because everything's new. Like as far as cameras or like us, I'll bring back Avatar. When we were on Avatar, no one knew how to do anything because we were the first people doing it. We're the first person using those kind of stereo cameras. We're the first people who had a virtual art department. So there was no books. It was just trial and error. And yeah, I mean, a lot of that budget, unfortunately, was huge was because no one did it and we just tried it. And like I said, the when we used complicated stuff and like I told these guys earlier, the main tool we used on that movie was a pool noodle. It was tails. It held models that we're using in 3D animations across. <laughs> uh, yeah, we used it to push cars along. I mean, and even James Cameron at certain points in time, he didn't get into big Chapman Dolly all the time. Sometimes when we're in the virtual world, we literally put him in a wheelchair like you do in film school. And he just wanted to hold the camera and be pushed around in a wheelchair. So <laughs> like all these skills still come up, you still use them. And yeah, it's challenge, you know, that's just a challenge. And then unfortunately, sometimes if you work on a couple of Marvel movies in, the, in a row, you don't have to be challenged. You just kind of save what you did for the last movie and turn it back in. And it's like, oh, where'd you get all this great stuff? How'd you do it so fast? <laughs> but yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, I do feel like the, the, the quality that's great to have no matter what department you're in is the creativity, the creativity and problem solving, like yeah. talking about with the, the pool noodles and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I love that story. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, I'm going to Ryan Green says he's a big, all caps, Godzilla fan. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, but he was wondering how you pick a, a team to work on post-production for your film. Uh, so like I said, we got to take it back to dailies. We go to a dailies company. We ask them to sit them in bids. We look at their work. Then we talk to the DP because the DP ultimately has to have a relationship. And sometimes, well, there'll be a daily, on the big movies, there's actually even a daily colorist. So sometimes we'll pick the place based off the coloring talent at there. And those guys move around. So sometimes that guy might be at Company 3 or he might be at Photochem, but sometimes the DPs will follow them. So we'll go through there. And then from DI houses, we'll do the same thing. We'll look for the big colorist or a colorist that likes to work with our dailies colorists and then we'll start putting them together. Obviously price does come in, but that's our first move is always creative first. And then we'll try to make the prices work or we'll bid them against each other knowing we want this other company. But yeah, it's usually a creative look. And then as far as editors, what we'll do, we'll create a list of editors that we'll think they might fit. And what we do is send it to the head of our company and she'll do a once over and send it to some like her creative team. And then we're like, okay, that person in this list is good enough to submit. Please submit this to the director. And then we'll take that and we'll give those lists to the director and so a little dad and then we'll set up meetings. And then we'll set up meetings with that, with the director and editor. And then they'll finally like pick a balance. And then, then we'll get like two or three she likes and tell them what the budget is and hope they take it or not. And usually, Hope most of the time it works out. If not, then sometimes you have to go back to the director and be like, sorry, which they don't like. We can't get them. They don't cost, you know, whatever. Gotcha. They cost not that much. And then the rest of the team, the editors bring. Mm -hmm. And we'll do that same process for sound, but it sounds usually with more of a company. So we'll go there, we'll pick our companies, we'll send it to the creative, then we'll show those companies and we'll get a resume of the talent that's in those companies and we'll send it to the director as well. Gotcha. Um, I think a good question to piggyback on that is from uh, Ronnie Kirk is, do you have any PA jobs you could direct this toward? You know, so we're saying that like, get in there and start even as a low level PA, like where do you find those jobs? Um, literally last week, one of my friends called me and she was like, hey, do you know any PAs? I mean, the, the hard part is getting that first job. I mean, everybody there's not really a strategy i mean 
look online. I mean, it's not, I mean, do your low budget stuff. If you see low budget, here's what I would say first. Let me, if you see a low budget project and you look at the talent and you're like, okay, people on this crew are gonna go somewhere. I think they have a lot of talent or somebody on that crew has done something else that works in the industry. Take that job, even if it's some other one pays more or whatever, but just don't do these low, unless you're just doing it for your own experience. If you wanna get a job, just don't take the job that gives you more money or whatever. If you're doing these like low budget things that people actually advertise for help, go and look and see who's working on them and take that job no matter what the pay is. Because that, if you do a good job there, they're going to remember you. And then you can ask them about being a PA. Um, unfortunately, now that I'm at the studio, I don't hire PAs anymore, right? I get hire assistants who want to work in the studio. But all the, all the coordinators are the people who hire PAs. So also take that in. Like, you don't want to be talking to anybody higher than the coordinator. It's not going to help you out. You just want to talk to the coordinators, and that's going to get you that first job. Uh, got a question here from Erie Fuentes. Uh, wondering if big studios are looking into independent projects. Are they trying to finance low budget film um, or will they in, in the future? Because I know you said like there are a lot of, the studios have all their big projects uh, backed up because of the pandemic. Like I was actually told like, don't worry about trying to, to pitch something to a big studio because they've got so much on their, you know, on the back burner for them. Is that, is that accurate or? I mean, not completely, but you're better or like your Lionsgate dimension. You want your mini majors and your mini studios are the ones that are pumping out stuff right now. Mm -hmm. um, your majors have to too, because they have to provide content for all their platforms. Right now, I think probably all of you guys, if you guys have exhausted Netflix, you're like, I've already seen all this stuff. It keeps showing me things I've already watched because yeah. everybody is starving for content. So right now that everything's open, they're pumping out a lot of these smaller movies. And like I said, my company, we never even did anything that wasn't a blockbuster. And now we're doing two blockbusters and five regular, like I said, mid to low budget movies at the time now. So everybody's trying to do a mid to low, cause it's low risk at the end of the day for these big studios. Just I mean, I won't tell you one, but one of the movies cost us 25 million to make and we sold it to Netflix for 60 million. Of course, if we had like a theatrical run, we had a chance to make 100 million, $150 million in the theater, yeah. but a $60 million guarantee is not bad. And we even worked the deal where they only own it for one or two years and they give it back to us. Oh, nice. So those quick turnarounds, if you're smaller and mid, and like you said, don't have the overhead, you're willing to do. Yeah. I, I'm curious for, for some of our listeners that aren't familiar with the terms, like what is like a typical blockbuster budget and like a mid budget, you know, indie budget, like okay. perspective. So when I talk blockbuster, I'm usually talking 90 million and above. Okay. Our mid is anywhere from, it's, some people say 15 million, but other people say 25, but it's in, usually 25 to 60. No one really has a name for 60 to, to 90 for some reason. They just toss it up. But anything below 15 is you're getting into your low budget round. And if you're 2 million and below, it's indie, super low budget. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, all right. All right. So we got another question from Joe Byron. Uh, when you were young, how did you see yourself in a filmmaking future? Uh, is the industry what you thought it would be? Well, first of all, I say I love making films. I mean, making films in any way in all the different positions, uh, I've definitely enjoyed and I've been in a lot of different departments. But no, you know, of course, you know, when you're in film school, you're thinking you're gonna go, you're gonna make your movie, you're gonna be a star soon. <laughs> and it's been a long route. And, uh, you know, eventually, I think I'm pretty close to the goal I initially had when I was 20 years old. But this year I'm gonna be 40. So <laughs> it's been 20 years in the making. So, I mean, it's more being patient with it. Obviously no one, everybody thinks I'm gonna be rich by 30 and have whatever car I want. Uh, and, and it does happen. Like I've, I've had a PA who's now making millions of dollars, but 
you know that those are rare occurrences and those are the stories you see when you watch movies but most of us have to get that grind on and there's you know there's certain people that just have special special talents but those are i mean think of the nba there's only a couple lebron and a couple kobe bryant's or you know most people in the league aren't making over you know three million dollars you just hear about the guys that are making 15 and 20 and those were the things, but you know, even NFL, like I think what minimum wage is eight hundred thousand dollars. That's what most people are doing. They're not making those huge contracts, and you can grind, and you know, people break out. You know, yeah, and that's that's pretty much the strategy. But I've never not had fun doing a job, and I've always taken it pretty much every job. I've only left jobs that were better, and I asked for permission first. And that's also one of the golden rules too. You're not allowed to leave a job unless it's for a higher title or a w- way more money. If you want to end your career quick, leave a job for another movie doing the same thing. That's one way to get yourself in trouble real quick. Gotcha. Um, that, that does kind of remind, because I know back when you were talking about, you know, the, the course of your career, you said there was there was a chunk of time where almost for a year, like, you just weren't working and you were considering like, is this what should I be doing? And, and I mean, you, you've, we've talked about like, you know, what students should think about like to get noticed and to get started. And, uh, but what would you say about when, when we do get to those times where it's like, is, should I be doing it? Like having doubts and like, you know, finding that uh, inside yourself to continue to persevere, especially during the pandemic, like everyone's just like, can't do anything <laughs> well i mean i think the pandemic is a special circumstances but i mean in those times when i wasn't working i at least got unemployment and then i, I think me and my friends we made like three films mm-hmm. they keep going you just get, you made your own going, yeah go ahead you, you just made your own stuff during that yeah, yeah we just made our own stuff i mean most a lot of it wasn't good <laughs> some of it was okay yeah. but it just keeps you going it keeps skills going and stuff like that and even when I was on Ender's Game, like me and one of one of the producing assistants, we're like, we're gonna make a movie, and we got all the other PAs together, and then all the acts, not all of them, but a lot of the actors that are our Ender's Game, they actually came and decided to be in our little movie that we we're just doing for fun. So we had, I mean, we except for the top bill, billing, we had pretty much the rest of the uh, the cast. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. And then they brought, they had their own cameras. They brought, they started bringing stuff and inviting friends as they knew to help. So you just got to keep moving, keep making your own films. Mm-hmm. I don't know, get a vlog. I don't know, keep yeah. your skills up. And, you know, it's going to happen. Like if you, if you work hard, it's going to happen. You just have to have patience. And like I said, mine was a thing. Like I did, there was just a time where I basically looked like I disappeared for three years. So now people are better keeping in touch with people because we don't really make too many movies in LA anymore. You always go to a different state or there. So people look, I know all you young kids are going to laugh at us, but we use Facebook a lot, man. Facebook, I've gotten jobs and given so many jobs off Facebook. Um, <laughs> and there's a couple groups too. I have to find them, but you guys can look them up. There's like new filmmakers in LA. There's a group for that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm still on there and I give now I just pass jobs along on there um, there's one for Australia because I was there just like stuff like that and then back in the days before all that stuff my friends all joined together and then it was all the top assistants and PAs and we just made like a Google chat basically and everybody started going or we'd ask questions like oh do you have this number do you know this person and we just kept on connecting like that so I would say jump on those Facebook groups, look them up. They're definitely there. So you just have to type them in and search and find them. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, oh, I was reading some questions. All right, we got a new question. Uh, do you have a favorite project that you've worked on? Okay, so <laughs> this is, a, I get asked this a lot. Your favorite <laughs> project? There's two answers. It's like favorite project of that you had that, because it looks great and it's, you know, a beautiful film, or there's your favorite project because it was the most fun to work on. <laughs> and, um, uh, I guess my favorite project was Avatar because, like I said, you I learned so much and we were literally doing stuff. And the funny part is all of us in the art department and virtual art department, we thought the movie was gonna suck. 
We were like, these blue people are so weird. This is so crazy. And then I remember going to the screening, the cast and crew screening, and sitting next to all the art department after the movie, we all looked at each other. We're like, that was good, wasn't it? And everybody was, yeah, because we had no idea. We thought the movie was going to be horrible. We're like, Shit, this is why James hasn't made a movie in 12 years. <laughs> Um, and then I guess my favorite movie was Ender's Game. Um, like I said, I think I was just a coordinator on that, but I still keep in touch with some of the actors on there, all the producers. Um, yeah, I still hang out with all the producers. Now they're like friends, we help each other out. So that was my fun, like my favorite movie to actually be a part of working on, but not as a scene on screen. Gotcha. Uh, I'm just scrolling through to make sure I didn't miss any questions. Um, well, what after Dune? What what do you have next coming up? Is it, can you tell us or because I know James Cameron's doing more Avatars, right? Did he call you up? Yeah, is, so I, I definitely got the call for yeah. for that Avatar. Um, I got calls for two, three, and four because they're doing them all together. Wow. Okay. And they were just gonna be, it was gonna be down the street from my house. And I'm like, and they had to be studio. I was like, I could ride my bike. So I didn't play in Delray. And now I work at a studio in Burbank. And I was this close to taking the job. And then I, I kind of went back into Legendary. <laughs> and I was like, hey, you know, James Cameron kind of wants me. And they're like, and I think I only been there for like four or six months at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, James wants me. And they're like, oh, okay. Well, how much money do you want? And do you want to become a director? Because I think I came in straight as a manager. And then I was like, well, I want you to at least match his number and then make me a director. And they're like, okay. Sweet. So that's why I stayed in a legendary. That's the way to do it. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, oh, there we are. There's like two places that the questions come in. I'm sorry. Uh, all right, we got a question from uh, Brittany Riley says, since we were talking about streaming services uh, with Warner Brothers facing court issues over HBO, what have you heard regarding everyone moving to streaming and how will this affect filmmakers or production companies? Well, also? I can't talk about that because our company is the main one suing <laughs> HBO, but I can tell you how I kind of, I mean, there's a platform war going on. If you yeah. notice, right before Disney Plus came out, uh, Netflix started pushing all those Marvel and Disney movies hard because they knew that Disney was going to pull all their content. Mm -hmm. There's a, obviously a little bit of stuff, but Disney pulled most of their content from Netflix. Warner Brothers saw what Disney was doing and they did the same. And I think Universal is going to follow suit. Well, so, is, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't. I, that it's going to be kind of interesting to say how it shifts out. Like I said, as a mini major, we don't really care. Like we'll send our movie to whatever Google, Amazon, whoever has the biggest check. But as far as those big companies, yeah, it doesn't make it does make sense because they get to keep it, they can retain it. But I think what happened with HBO Max is that we had all these companies, including our company, we had theater deals with them and theater deals and they tried to cancel our theater deal and only release on HBO Max. And there's some movies that are fine for streaming, but when you're talking about Godzilla or Dune or something like that, it's not the same movie. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah, we don't even make it. There's also a thing talked about, if you know your movie is an Oscar movie, you shoot it differently than you would shoot it if it's a regular movie, because most movies, are seen in, you know, stadium seats like that. So now your lens, lens has changed. So maybe you would use a 25 or 35, since you know they're gonna be in stadium seating, you're now gonna use a 15. <clears throat> so if you think you're gonna be like an Oscar worthy movie, you actually use more of the traditional lenses because you know when they're really reviewing your theater, they're gonna be in a traditional theater set like that. So it, all those things come into play and if you're only going to be streaming, you're not going to waste the money that we spend on a big DI to color it because you only need to worry about the color for a TV screen. Yeah. And that's usually our afterthought. Usually we make a big theatrical and then we mix down the audio and mix down the picture to fit a television. Gotcha. So, you know, you got to tell people before, otherwise you, we just wasted yeah. our money. Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, cool. We're, we're just about out of time. I want to make sure I didn't miss anyone or, or is there anything else uh, you wanted to cover that I totally forgot about? I mean, I'm okay for a couple more questions. Um, sure. um, let's see. Uh, do you have any, uh, well, let's talk about the school again. Do you, do you have any memories of the Los Angeles Film School? Like what's, what, what yeah, your experience I, like here? Yeah. I, yeah, and like I just said, I think the most important is do getting involved in all those projects the most you can. Because like I said, th that experience, I had no idea how much that experience was going to help me. I was like, oh, so much of a project might be terrible <laughs> or something like that. You know how you think when you're in school. But no, all those experiences are good. And I think a lot of people, too, in film school, they're just trying to make the best project out of like their peers. But I would say, don't go for the, just go for, take a risk, try to do something new, try to do something a different way. Then, I mean, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, but at least now you have a base, you know that doesn't work, or you can see how can I make that work? And that skill might pop up somewhere later and you'll be like, oh, I tried this once when I was here at film school and it didn't work out. And now you're now when you're in a big job, you're collaborating with other people. And they'd be like, oh, well, maybe if you do this, because that's kind of how like that scan back thing happened. So I would say just take the risk. Don't just try to make the prettiest one. So, you know, you're just making your, you know, teacher or students feel bad. Do what you want and, right. you know, then challenge yourself. Experiment and explore. Yeah, experiment. Yeah. Now's the time to, to do it. Uh... Joe Byron asks, uh, you, oh, he says you haven't lost any energy from when you were here in your 20s. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joe. <laughs> All right, so I think we'll wrap it up. That was a good spot to end. Thank you very much, Jason. I appreciate you your time and good luck Keep with everything. Keep working hard. And if you guys have questions, talk to these guys. I'll know how to reach out to me. And if I find any jobs, I'll send them to these guys. All right, cool. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye.